All right. So his story begins in New Jersey. He's a second no. generation. <laughs> I know. It's uh, and it's and, one of the cities that he names as he's just naming cities in one of those songs. You are talking about John Bon Jovi, right? Bon, bon Jovi. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I hear he has a rest stop named after him on the Jersey Turnpike, some Turnpike somewhere. I'm gonna go yeah. that someday. <laughs> So he is a second generation Italian American born to John, sorry, born John Francis Bongiovi in 1962 in Perth Amboy, New Jersey, the firstborn of John and Carol, who were his parents. So the Bongiovi family originally came from Sicily, not a big surprise there, but John comes from a hard working family. His father was a Marine eventually became a plumber and wound up being a barber in his later years. His mother was a stay at home mom. His dad but... was an Italian plumber. That's uh, <laughs> delicious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Please tell me his name was Mario. Certified badass. All right. But that's just a little sidetrack, but I feel like I should tell you guys that I recently learned that Nintendo had an angry Italian landlord with a big mustache. who was, knocking on their door asking for rent at their seattle offices named mario and that's what they named the character after get really out funny. dude yeah. that's hilarious so some more fun trivia about his mom she won miss erie pennsylvania and had a stint as a playboy bunny but that was back when playboy bunny was just sexy outfits so at age four his family picks up from perth amboy and moves to sayreville in new jersey Sayreville is a small working class town at the time in the mid 60s. Geographically, it's in the middle of this industrial east coast of New Jersey. A lot of smokestacks, a lot of factories, tons of Italian and Irish immigrants. Now, the family didn't have a ton of money, but they were never in danger of starving or losing their house, as was the same for most of the people in the neighborhood. Everyone kind of appeared to be in the same boat, just working hard to get by. Now, growing up, he had zero interest in school, and generally wasn't into sports either. And he's like, have you seen what I look like? I don't know. I, know. I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't damage this. <laughs> Life is just going to get handed to me. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> Do you see these blue eyes? In 1969, John is seven years old, and his mother buys him his first instrument, which is an acoustic guitar. He also got a copy of a Roy Clark Learn at Home guitar book. Which, by the way, side note, God, Roy Clark is a badass. Have you ever seen any of those little videos that pop up of him on Instagram or YouTube? The guy was a shredder in like 1965. Unbelievable. No. All right. No, he has, he's the guy with like the crazy fast picking hand, right? He yeah. He just can shred the picks. Yeah. And a country dude as well. Yeah. Yeah. He's pretty, he's pretty badass. So in, in that recent documentary you guys mentioned, he did mention that he really wasn't into music as a kid. And despite getting guitar lessons and that book, he wound up losing interest and at some point throws his guitar down the basement steps. He breaks a couple tuning pegs off along the way, and the guitar would sit in the basement for years. Now, music wasn't too far away, though, and he noted that his first music that he really fell in love with was Elton John. And despite buying Elton John's follow-up to Yellow Brick Road, which was an album called Caribou from 1974, John eventually shifts away from Elton and fell in love with the Jay Giles Band, who at the time was actually a rhythm and blues outfit. Oh, okay. They were not just known for, they were not playing centerfold at that point. Apparently it was a big shift. They went super pop, but early on, they were more of a rhythm and blues outfit. Now you're telling me I have to respect Jay Giles Band, Adam? I didn't say that because I didn't <laughs> listen to any of that early stuff. We'll see if it's on the list of the 1001. I'm doubtful. All right. It's 1975. John is fired up. He's being, he's being inspired by all the music at the time. And he goes and decides to dig up his old guitar from the basement. And he starts teaching himself guitar along with some help from a neighbor who was a gigging musician at the time. Now that neighbor told John, I'm only going to teach you if you do the work. I don't really have time to be bothered with this if you're not interested. He also told him that he was going to kick his ass if he didn't learn how to play House of the Rising Sun. So this kind of snapped Bon Jovi into focusing more on guitar. Growing up, his parents always said that he had this deterministic streak in him where once he got his mind on something, he was going to go hard for it. 
So he starts playing guitar. He's teaching himself. He's getting lessons. Now, even as a young teenager, he knew that he wanted to be a rock star. He remembers seeing Rush in New York City when he was young, and that was kind of a pivotal moment where this rock star vision solidified. And during these really formative years, he gets into bands like Thin Lizzy and Aerosmith, but there was one performer who really changed his life. You have any idea who that might have been? I'll give you three hints. 1975, New Jersey, and... Uh, yeah, Probably the boss. That was yeah, yeah. I like how you're like, as a teenager, he wanted to be a rock star. Yeah, fucking who same, dude. Right? Everybody <laughs> wanted to be a rock star. Yeah. Come on, man. I wanted to be a rock star. I just don't look like a goddamn model and have a voice that... <laughs> I mean, I probably actually have probably a similar voice to Bon Jovi. Right. <laughs> so Bruce was huge in his life because he said that at the time he had posters on his walls of Led Zeppelin and Kiss and all these giant bands that were may have may as well have just been on another planet. But Bruce, he was right over there. He was in New Jersey. He could see him. He could drive to a Bruce Springsteen gig. And Bruce was an average guy. He wasn't pretending to be a rock star. What he was doing was attainable. So this really, you know, further lit, further added fuel to Bon Jovi's determination here. Yeah, you go see Bruce and he's like, what's that old Ben Stiller skit? He's like refilling the ketchup bottles and mopping the floor. <laughs> the right, right. Yeah, yeah. Just a work that, class dude, man. <laughs> but even that joke is born of, I think, this era of probably early 80s, late 70s, early 80s Bruce, where he would just pop in. He was already a yeah. superstar, right? Born to Run was like released in 74, 75. But he would show up at bars and play, join the band for hours at a time and, you know, play crazy shows just randomly. Yeah. So it's 1977, John is 15 years old, and he's completely obsessed at this point with music, guitars, songwriting. His bedroom is postered with bands from the 70s. He's even writing lyrics on the walls in his room. He turns 16, and then he's, he turns 16, and he starts sneaking into all the smoke-filled bars, because at that time, the drinking age in New Jersey was only 18. So it was a lot easier to pass for 18 if you were 16 than trying to pass for 21 <laughs> at 16. <laughs> So he's able to sneak into all these clubs and it's here in the New Jersey nightclub scene that he's finally able to start seeing live music, live acts, and decides to put together his first band called Raze, R-A-Z-E. And they sucked, but so does every band <laughs> full of 16 year olds. They wound up, had a gig at a talent contest and they did a Kiss song. I think they played Taking Care of Business and they lost but it was a good first experience. So now undeterred, he keeps trying to put together bands. And at this point, they're all cover bands, but he wants to start playing in some New Jersey nightclubs where he's seeing all the big New Jersey acts. And when I say big bands, there was a small contingent of acts that were making up the Asbury Park music scene. Bands like Southside Johnny and the Asbury Dukes, obviously Bruce Springsteen. So in 1979, John puts together a 10-piece rhythm and blues band called Atlantic City Expressway. Sounds like a wedding band, and it probably was. What the hell were the other six guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> lots of horns. That The Asbury Park scene had lots of horns. Okay. Now, ten a 10-piece band is a lot of mouths to feed. And at this point, he's 17, but who cares if you're losing money with every gig? You're just getting out there and having fun. And this band, Atlantic City Expressway, was actually gaining popularity. So it's no surprise that John is obviously the focal point of the band. Like you guys said, Bon Jovi is a gorgeous man. And at that time, he had long hair, those piercing blue eyes, slender build, holding a mic on stage. I mean, come on, I'm even a little turned on just talking about him right now. But he's still in high school at this point. That's even creepier now that I said that last time. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah. was hot as shit. Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, God. I just gave you something for the soundboard, didn't I? You're going to pull that. <laughs> no, no. You're done. Come on. We'll keep it. So he's in high school at this point. He's gigging until 3 a.m. most nights. He's heading back home, going to bed at 4 and waking up to be at school at 8 a.m. where he promptly fell asleep in class. However, he did have one really fun story to tell after crawling into school one morning, and it's something, Rob, you mentioned. 
Turns out that the night before, none other than Bruce Springsteen dropped into the club where Atlantic City Expressway was playing. He got up on stage and sang Promised Land, one of his own songs with John. And John later said that that moment, again, further fuel really inspired him and made him realize that his success was attainable. And people who saw that performance noted that Bon Jovi was not starstruck. Bon Jovi was on stage like, oh, hey, we're doing a duet here. Which I can, thought we was just, pretty can we just take a moment to appreciate how insane an experience that would be? If you're like 18 <laughs> in a cover band and you're covering a Bruce Springsteen song and he just shows up behind you shows and sing up. with you. Right. Yeah. Well, and for a lot of people, and there's definitely like two different ways to approach that. Some people would be like, well, I have peaked. Okay, right. time to go get a regular fucking job. <laughs> right. And some people are like, well, I can be a rock star now. And good for him taking the road of, well, I can be a rock star now. So John now sees his band Atlantic City Expressway as a great learning experience, but he also realizes he's not going to really reach any rock star aspirations than a cover band. So he turns 18, he turns 18 and he heads to New York along with the keyboard player from Atlantic City Expressway, a guy named Dave Rauschbaum, who had recently gotten accepted into the Juilliard School of Music in New York City. Now, John moves to New York, and he does have a connection in the music business, but I'll let you guys gauge how much of his career is a function of nepotism. So he gets a job at a New York City recording studio called The Power Station, which is owned by his father's cousin. So John was basically a gopher, sweeping floors, making coffee, grabbing cigarettes for the likes of Mick Jagger and David Bowie. But being an errand boy also had some positives. First off, he had an he had an he had a firsthand opportunity to see how recording an album actually happens. Like he was either looking through the studio doors and watching everything that's going oh, yeah. on. That's like All the studio in New York at the time. Right? I mean, that is like yeah. get. Yeah. Yeah. Just the fact that you get to run down the street to grab cigarettes for Mick Jagger. I'm calling nepotism on that one. Put like, in the door. Yeah. Put in the door. Yeah. Nobody we'll see gets the put that door later as well. Yeah. So this was conveniently left out of the documentary, but they mentioned it in the book a little bit. But his father's cousin also allowed him to make demos during downtime at the studio. Now, as you guys know, a big studio, you're talking like the slot between 3 and 5 a.m., on a Tuesday is when mm. he got studio time. But Tom and I have taken that slot before. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so yeah. Doesn't produce the best material, let me tell you. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> but his cousin still charged him. So John is making virtually no money as a gopher, and he's actually in debt to his cousin as he's using studio time to record demos. John also has no band at this point. And he would spend all of his available time writing lyrics and chord patterns. He's literally sleeping in the studio, occasionally staying at his cousin's place, Tony. But he said that was rough because his cousin, like, I know his cousin, Tony from Sicily. Tony Bon Jovi. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Tony Bon Jovi. Let's go get a dinner at Buca de Beppo. <laughs> yeah. You probably should cut that. We gonna oh, that I like it. We'll see. <laughs> I'll, I'll gauge it. <laughs> But now John starts to put together a band that has a rotating cast of musicians that he calls the Letchers. But he was really only using that <laughs> as an outlet for Sorry. an outlet for him to try the material that he's writing in front of crowds. So that band played around in some clubs in Manhattan and Brooklyn, but it was short lived. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. L E C H E R S. No, that's correct. I just but think it's, it's a great like name. I can't believe it's not taken. Yeah. <laughs> so that band kind of fizzled. He winds up putting together another band called the Wild Ones, which included a childhood friend on guitar named Dave Sabo, who would actually wind up becoming the lead guitarist for Skid Row. Uh, also in this new band is David Rashbaum, who was again studying classical music at Juilliard and John convinces him to kind of hang up the Juilliard track and jump in with him. Now, at what point in the conversation does he say, I'd like you to join a band with me? By the way, that band will be called Bon Jovi. But yes, that's correct. That's my <laughs> <Yes>. name. Yeah. 
there will be no negotiation on this. Point. But but you know, in the in the context in the context of like Led Zeppelin and Def Leppard, you know, Bon Jovi kind of works. Van Halen. He's thinking That's of Van Halen exactly. for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just mean it's awkward. Well, at least Van Halen had two Van Halens in the band. This one, you're just like you were starting from nothing, and you're just telling people, no, this is what the band is called. End of end of story. Yeah. Well, you'll see that when he gets signed, he really is a solo artist when it starts because he doesn't have a band behind him yet that kind of comes along the way kind of runs parallel so this band that he's playing with now a bit more professional they got some gigs opening for south side johnny and the asbury dukes and at this point south side johnny had released five albums had you guys ever heard of south side johnny and the I, know asbury? Him, I know him from the springsteen story but yeah they okay. never really made it out of the regional band thing but i know that right. I think Steve Van Sant played with them for a while and maybe even Springsteen stole him away from that band or something. So it was like this longstanding rotating band that played on right. the Jersey Shore. Yeah, that was the ones. So now Southside Johnny has a decent following, like you said, along the East Coast. And so John and this pickup band are now opening and are playing to larger audiences. And that is exposing him to the dynamics of working a large crowd. Because if there's one thing you can't take away from John, from Bon Jovi, it is that he can work a crowd. He is a master of the stage, and I, I'll definitely give that to him. So he's still working at the power station and putting together more demo tapes, and he's trying desperately to get A&R guys from any label to give him the time of day. But money is running short, and after a year at the power station, he's got to take on more jobs. So he starts working at a car wash. He works as a shop assistant. He's selling newspaper subscriptions door to door and even working at a junkyard. So now it's 1982, and just for some flavor, Journey releases Open Arms. Eye of the Tiger is released by Survivor, not Journey. And Centerfold comes out by Jay Giles' band. I just had to throw that in there for a little context on where Jay Giles is in our life right now. God, yeah, it's, we should chart everything in history by where Jay Giles' band is at. <laughs> this pre or post Giles. All right. Yeah, well, a, which one? Centerfold yeah. Giles? Or? Is this a BJBG? <laughs> no, JGB, yeah. JGB. <laughs> so at this point in his yet to even start career, John's got something like four albums worth of demos, but nothing is really clicking. This is, of course, until he writes the song Runaway. And he knew that he had something. Now, this is where that nepotism thing comes in. He somehow goes unexplained, but he gets Billy Squire to produce the song and gets a bunch of powerhouse musicians to lay down the track, including, including Roy Bitten, who was the keyboard player from the E Street Band. <clears throat> and Billy Squire, the one big tune that I know by him is that Lonely is the Night, right? Which sounds like a Zeppelin song, but it's not. Right. Yeah. 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 So the... That's not a normal kid access thing right. you don't be like i got this great song let me just randomly contact uh, also, also, right. also also adam are you, gonna, are you gonna talk about his first uh professional recording at all yes that is coming okay, up okay okay don't okay. ruin it for the listeners i will not i will not <laughs> right. so they record runaway but no one really takes it seriously he went to something like 11 record companies and got zero callbacks and in that documentary John Bon Jovi says he was out of options. He doesn't know who to go to. And he tried to think, who are the loneliest people in the world? I know DJs on radio stations. They're always sad and lonely. So he was like, maybe I'll go try to befriend one and give him this tape. And that's exactly what he does. He goes to a radio station out of Manhattan. I think it was called, ah, hang on one second. I hope that wasn't his thought process. Like he's, I wonder. He said, <laughs> he said that in the uh, wow. in the uh, 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 the documentary. Smart teenager. Yeah. W pop or something. W balls. No. <laughs> w balls. W balls. Sorry. All right. So John takes it to a radio station in Long Island and manages to get it played by one of the DJs there. The guy liked it, and he entered it into a talent contest where it won one of the regional heats. So in early 1983, Bon Jovi got his song featured on a compilation album of unsigned rock acts out of New York called New York Rocks 1983. 
Wait, hold on. I'm a little confused. I thought there was going to be more to that anecdote. You're telling me that his big innovation was to try to get it into a DJ's hands on the radio? That seems pretty basic to me. Pretty standard. Yeah, I thought you were going to say he followed the guy home and tried to get a job at the same coffee shop he worked at on the weekends or trash. something. No. <laughs> what you don't understand is that he's John Bon Jovi, and he just walks into the place, and everyone's like, yes, please. Who are you? Be around me. Come through here. <laughs> yeah. Like, the secretary's like, oh, my goodness. Yes, please walk through. <laughs> Come get a look at you as you walk on by. Yeah, whatever. The DJ's like, right. right. That's can I that's probably where all <laughs> that's probably where all the nepotism thing is going on behind the scenes, you know? I mean, that he's every, just every, gorgeous. every yeah. big DJ in New York City probably got 100 tapes a week to, to, live, yeah. to go through back yeah. in that air time, you know? So he gets included on this album called New York Rocks 1983, and that's where the story ends. John Bon Jovi retires from music and now sells insurance in a New Jersey suburb. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, of course. But that is a great spot for our favorite part of the episode, which is Bon Jovi by the numbers. Woo, right. woo, 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 woo. <laughs> and these, these are going to be some numbers, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we start with 130. As in 130 million. That is total album sales worldwide over the last 40 years. That number is friggin' insane. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot of fucking cheese. And yes. not only that, he was selling stadiums throughout the mid to late 80s. He was just, yeah. he must have been raking in the cash. And I also get the sense that he was not blowing it all on cocaine. So unlike they most were, 80s rockers, he seemed like he was actually pretty straight-laced. They drank a lot. I didn't see anything that said they got into hard drugs. And they always prided themselves that whenever they performed, they were never high, they were never drunk. They would party like rock stars afterwards in the middle of the night, but he said every time they went on stage, they were sober and they put out the best performance they could do. That's honestly pretty admirable. I think a lot of bands probably start that way, and then and then as, it quickly you know, goes south. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. Morning beers, you know. It's underrated thing to do that really makes a difference. Like, can you imagine? Have you guys ever been to a show where you can tell the band is too messed up and just puts on a bad show for one reason or another? It's really disappointing. Yeah, you, you know, yeah. don't have really money, just, and yeah. yeah. Or and like, frankly, I think we've talked about this <clears throat> on previous episodes. It's first beer. And then second beer, right as I'm going on stage. Like that's that's the perfect zone for me. I get one right. beer before yeah. the show and then one beer as I'm going on stage and that's it. You reach and your cruising altitude and yeah. you're good to go. I will drink a lot. Yeah, of I like I like two. Beer. I like two before one on I like two before and then one on stage. Well, this is your drinking problem. You can tweak that for me a little bit. Well, <laughs> two, two of us two, two dozen. <laughs> Come on. All right. Next number is five seven one. As in U571, which is a great World War II submarine movie that he was in in the early 2000s. Where <laughs> a, US, a U.S. ship captures an Enigma machine. He start across from Matthew McConaughey and the one and only, the one and only Harvey Keitel. Great. Wow. All wow. right. Were you that desperate for numbers? For your numbers? <laughs> <laughs> Always loved that movie. And he's got, yeah. he's got some acting chops. All right, this is what Marty was talking about. So our next number is two and two. But first, I'm going to separate that out with a couple letters. So let's throw in an R and a D in there. As in, R2-D2, we wish you a Merry Christmas. This was technically John's first professional recording that was included on an album. It was included on a 1980 Star Wars-themed Christmas album called Christmas in the Stars. You're welcome. Jeez. Uh, everyone should give that song a listen. I mean, is it any good? <laughs> it, yeah, it's terrible. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a Christmas hearing, song about Star just, Wars. So yeah, it's, it's funny on. hearing it's funny hearing him in that in that context. He just sounds like a little like punk. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, luckily, everyone, it's on the playlist linked in the episode notes. Just like every week, every random toss-off song we mention, we get it on the playlist, so you can go check it out. All right, well, uh, thank- right next to Centerfold. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next number is 14.3. As in 14.3 billion, that's the number of guitar squeals or pinch harmonics that appear on this album. 
<laughs> Sorry, that was a joke. All right. No, it was impressive. Yeah. That was an impressive <laughs> amount of pinch harmonics. It really stop. Because especially when you listen to it loud in headphones, and just that kind of <laughs> comes in out of nowhere. Like, God damn it, just play it a lick, becomes, man. Yeah. It it's a lot of squawk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Next number is 500,000. That is the number of albums that Mercury Records destroyed voluntarily so they wouldn't be released in the USA due to a debacle with the album cover that we'll get into in just a little bit. Mm. 28. Tom, this goes back to how much they made on tour. 28 million. That's how much Bon Jovi brought in for their headlining tour to support this album. A total of 220 shows between July of 1986 and October of 1987. These dudes were working. So 220 <clears throat> shows, $28 million. That's less money per show than I thought that they would, you would have made. thought. I guess it right? was the 80s, but still, like, I would have thought they would have made more. Maybe, I guess ticket prices have gone insane these days. And, you know, Taylor Smith, Swift's a billionaire now from two tours. Right. But, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> All right, next up, the number three, which is the steady members there have been in Bon Jovi for the last 40 years. John, Tico Torres, and the keyboard player David Bryan slash David Rauschbaum. He kind of changed his name once they got famous. Sambora played with them for 30 years, and similarly, Hugh McDonald has been playing with them for about 30 years as well. Hmm. Now, you hear us say it at the end of every By the Numbers, but we want to thank you for all the support you've given us over the past three-plus years. So if you're looking to help us keep this thing going and growing, we've got three things you can do. <laughs> the first one is super easy. If you're listening on Spotify, there's a feature where you can comment on this episode right in the bottom there. So go ahead, chime in, let us know what you think. The second way would be to stay in whatever app you're using right now to listen to us and give us a five-star rating. Lastly, if you're looking to get even deeper into our world of music geekery, head over to Patreon where you can sign up for free to get our newsletter and notifications of some of the new content we're creating over on that channel. The link, as always, is in the episode notes. And if you're too lazy to do any of those things, just keep listening and enjoy yourself. <laughs> so when we last left John, his song Runaway was on a compilation album released by a radio station, but it took off very quickly. The radio station that first played his song was part of a national company. And so a bunch of radio stations all over the U.S. put that on their normal rotation. <laughs> Excuse me. A&R teams started taking notice of the song. And very shortly afterwards, Atlantic Records and Polygram Records are approaching John to try to sign him. On July 1st of 1983, John signs a record contract with Polygram Records. And they basically signed John as a solo act. So he had to quickly throw together a band. So the first guy he calls is obviously David Rochbaum, who eventually, like I said, shortens his name to David Bryan, the keyboard player that he's known for over a decade. So David finally officially drops out of Juilliard to join, to join the band. Next was Alex, Alec John Such, a New York session bass player. He knew drummer Tico Torres. Tico knew guitar player Richie Sambora. So they all kind of like met up through kind of word of mouth. And... Richie, the guitar player, actually had to be convinced and had to come out and see John in action in order to, to get on board with it. And eventually, when he saw John, Richie approached John and said, hey, I'm your new guitar player. He was so impressed with John's stage presence. Well, it sounds like he was leading bands of his own at the time and writing tunes. And, you know, I see why that's maybe a little bit hard to go sign up for someone else's band. But and yet, yes, that I makes... Yeah, and yet that does make, when those situations work out, that makes some of the most powerful bands and even songwriting teams, right? And, yeah. and, also, and also the most powerful <clears throat> breakups. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the band doesn't have a name yet. Originally, the record label wanted to give him a stage name. This is John. Wanted to give John a stage name of Johnny London or Johnny Lightning, which he refused. Eventually, <laughs> Johnny Lightning. Johnny Lightning. Who the good. fuck are these A&R guys? Like, yeah, you got to be Johnny Lightning. Everyone will buy that. It's great. <laughs> well, there's already a Johnny Thunder, so I guess they're playing off that. All this is just playing off past successes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, they all settle on a less ethnic form of his own name and went to Bon Jovi for, instead of Bon Jovi. So they start playing out lots of gigs and empty rooms just to get their footing as a live act and eventually hire a guy named Doc McGee to be their manager. 
Doc was also managing Motley Crue at the time. So the band goes into the the band goes into the studio and records their debut over the course of 1983, all while tightening their live act and performing almost nightly. And in 1984, Bon Jovi releases their debut album entitled Bon Jovi. Now, John is just shy of 22 years old when this album is released, and it sells decently, 350,000 copies, I think, in the first year. And to date, it's got over 2 million copies sold. I just wanted to bring up the anecdote that I saw in that Hulu documentary that I thought was kind of interesting from around this time. I think it was literally when they were considering signing with that manager. They played Madison Square Garden opening for ZZ Top. It was a huge opportunity for them, for them, the whole band, and very exciting. First time they're playing Madison Square Garden. But, you know, being an opening band, challenging, right? But they talk about how they went out on stage. The whole thing's supposed to start with like a guitar solo and Richie Zamporer's guitar just does not work. And the crowd just starts booing them and chanting for ZZ Top. <laughs> like, right, could, like that's the worst possible outcome. Oh my God. Oh, and this is ZZ Top on like the Eliminator <laughs> tour too. So, right? oh, yeah, yeah, they're right. They're crushing it in the 80s at this time. Yeah. So now eight of the nine songs on that first album were written by John and the band. Not the most mature stuff, but he's 22, so he's writing about love, sex, hot women, sex, hot women, sex, broken relationships, sex, hot women. Yeah. But do yourself a favor. Luckily, he moved beyond all that sex noise stuff. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Got it to the real heart of the matter once (laughs) everyone (laughs) went. Do yourself a favor, by the way, and go back and watch the MTV MTV video for Runaway. It's amazingly bad. And as we've heard in other bands where they are forced to make videos on their own dime. And so this first video that they made was for $60,000 in the mid eighties, which is like $180,000 today. That's a lot of money to put together a shitty video that then the band has to recoup through album sales. But anyway, they, it would not be the first or I'm sorry, it would not be the last of their terrible videos. Plenty of which you can find on YouTube. So the band's early sound, interesting mix of soft rock power ballads. So you've got simultaneously Richie Sambora, who's a monster on guitar. Like you said, Rob, like he was the front, he was fronting other bands as a guitar player, like halfway metal. And then you've got Bon Jovi singing. So he shreds. He shreds. He does. You know, this, sorry, a little digression maybe that. It's occurring to me that I don't, I can't think of the music videos for any of these huge hits. I, I'm sure they existed and I'm sure I've seen them because watching the hell out of MTV during this entire period, but they, it doesn't seem like they were fully able to capture the zeitgeist of the music video in the way that other artists I feel, were. I feel like Wanted, I think Wanted Dead or Alive was on heavy rotation. Yeah, that had him like riding a motorcycle. Yeah. But I think Living on a Prayer is just like footage of them playing concerts live. It's not, it's sort of like the yeah, Paradise yeah. City video or something. I just mean that it, it because it's not a big thing in my memory, I'm thinking that they weren't quite able to take advantage of that medium in the way that other artists maybe were, which is surprising, especially because, again, Bon Jovi's a handsome dude. Yeah. yeah. And this was like peak MTV, 80s, big videos. Like we hadn't quite gotten material not material world we hadn't quite gotten express yourself yet i think mm, Maybe that right. came out a little bit later and that's where the real money started pouring into the videos but people were definitely hip to the fact that a good video did a lot for you right. actually the the video i think of when i think of bon jovi came later when he was on the young guns 2 soundtrack and it's oh, just yeah. on blaze of glory and he's just out oh yeah blaze is here right and he's strumming right. an acoustic guitar like on a cliffside and there's just a projector showing scenes from the movie in the background <laughs> i remember you mentioning that on a prior episode like i don't know 50 episodes ago or something like how do we shoehorn in this movie into this uh <laughs> desert scene that video so like- cost two hundred thousand dollars <laughs> <laughs> Like Rob said, they opened for ZZ Top. They also started opening for the Scorpions, who were total dicks. Bon Jovi had no lighting rigs. They wouldn't let them use a lighting <laughs> rig. They wouldn't let them use like the space. So Bon Jovi's pushed to the front of the stage. You know, there's no lights on them. And the Scorpion fans were known to throw shit at them. So there was one story that Richie Sambora tells where he was actually wearing like, uh, like a helmet, like a construction helmet, to because they were. Th- 
because the audience was throwing quarters at them. So like he was playing yeah. and you could feel and hear ding, it's, ding, ding as people were throwing shit at him. It's tough to be an opening band, certainly, especially at these hard rock shows. And I think part of the story there is they weren't nearly as hard as a band like oh, the Scorpions, right? right? Yeah, right. They were a little more the on the pop side of things. Yeah. Scorpions right. are a huge band out of Germany that are like the only market they haven't cracked into is the US. They're like huge in every country other than the US. Yeah. We know them from Rocky Like a Hurricane, I think is, is their biggest hit right mm-hmm. in America. But yeah, that's funny. I kind of just want to hear Tom try a German accent. Uh, <laughs> already offended Italians. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> Who is this good looking man? <laughs> you cannot catch my lighting rig. <laughs> Americans. <laughs> Now, all these opening experiences just serve to build the brotherhood of the band. They eventually wind up opening for Kiss on a British tour, and they're doing roughly nine months straight of touring. So they get off that tour. Hold on. And, yeah. Hold on. I think an important detail is this was the Kiss without makeup Without. Tour. Oh, 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 damn. Yeah. Really showcasing their ugliness compared yeah. to Bon Jovi. <laughs> right, right, right. Gene Bon Jovi must have looked front, like a unadorned. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, no kitty cat, no kitty cat drummer. <laughs> so they get off that tour. John is given six weeks to come up with material for the second album. So the band moves into a two-bedroom apartment and they start writing for the next album. Now they wind up in Philly, and this is kind of fun. They record it at a place called the Warehouse, which is right along Delaware Avenue in Philly, right along the Delaware River. And I actually used to rehearse there for a band I was in at one point. And I had no idea that Bon Jovi recorded their second and probably least successful album in one of those rooms. <laughs> okay, so wait, is, is this where so the wait. struggle comes in? Because you told me that they grounded out nose to the grindstone, but they put an album out and then went on tour and kiss in fucking Europe. Ah. Like, where's the struggle? Right, like, right. And I, think and, I, the- I, I, and I imagine uh, Philadelphia is also where they got quarters thrown at them uh, on stage. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> guess. That's a good <laughs> guess. I think what Adam's trying to say is they were road dogs for a long yeah. time, and they took the approach of playing every club in every small market and trying to kind of win fans organically in that way for a long time. Right. <clears throat> All right. All right. So their second album – is called 7,800 Degrees Fahrenheit. It did all right when it was released in May of 1985, and it reached 37 on the Billboard charts. More terrible music videos, but in retrospect, nobody in the band really liked the album. They all Adam, kind of was over. Yes. You have to tell us why they gave it that catchy title, right? Oh, I, I didn't get that story. It's because that's the temperature at which rock melts. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up. Oh my God. Wow. Oh, it's the same guy who wanted Johnny Lightning. <laughs> was the one who came up with, Fellas, we got to start melting shit. All right. Fine. Second album, 1700 Degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, thank you, Rob. Hey, what does that mean? Does it mean we're post rock? We're above rock? I'm, I don't I'm know. not clear. Not clear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're destroying rock. We're destroying Ooh, rock. Yeah. argument that they're actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the band is doing okay. They're still not making a ton of money. They continued opening for other bands like Rat, who they did a tour with for six months. They wind up getting a couple headlining shows in Japan where they actually sell out in Japan. They're huge in Japan, as we said. Similarly, in the UK, they did pretty well with some sold out uh, headlining shows. But something else happens in 1985, specifically in April of 1985. Van Halen breaks up. So now you've got this space in the rock world that used to be filled with hairspray and guitars and spandex and Bon Jovi mm-hmm. kind of fits the mold to perfectly slide into that vacancy. Yeah. And a two word ambiguously ethnic yeah. name. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. I think I like that. That's an interesting detail that I didn't know, but also I think the reason they're playing so much, and this is part of what they got across in that documentary that it's nice for a band to have that time before they break big because they develop their stagecraft. And I think not only do you hear it, you know, that's why they were able to sell out stadiums on the tour for this album, but I think you also hear it in the songwriting here. We've already mentioned that these are built for arenas and that has to just come together somewhat organically over time. 
All right, we're approaching the end of 1985. You've got a band that has been touring as openers nonstop for two years. They're making no real money. Two of the guys in the band, their marriages are falling apart. They're not in a great spot. But that brings us to 1986 and Bon Jovi's third album. That's the one we're talking about today. So the whole band saw this next outing as do or die. If they didn't sell at least a million copper, if they didn't sell at least a million copies, they were all pretty sure the label was going to drop them. So for the next album, John and Richie, the guitar player, would go to Richie's parents' house in Woodbridge, New <laughs> Jersey, head into a dank basement, Marty, with their acoustic <laughs> guitars in hand <laughs> and a tape recorder and would write for hours, day after day. Now, John is up against the wall financially. He feels it's his responsibility to bring the band through this. And in spring of 1986, they're working with Bruce Fairbairn a Canadian-born producer <laughs> with Lover Loverboy and Blue Oyster Cult. They also decide to collaborate with a professional songwriter named Desmond Child, who gets a co-writing credit on four of the 10 songs on this album. Now, Bruce Fairbairn... <clears throat> Fairbairn? Fairbairn? So producer Bruce... I'll just call him producer Bruce, because I don't know how to pronounce <laughs> his last name. Producer <laughs> Bruce opted to have the band leave their comfort zone and head up to Vancouver, Canada, and record at Little Mountain Sound Studios. Vancouver, home of rock and roll, as we <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Where rock goes to melt. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. The home of a lot of debauchery, because they rented a condo while they were in Canada, which they completely destroyed. After they left, the landlord had the, the landlord had to have the carpets ripped out and replaced, completely redecorated and refurnished the condo. Hmm. The band spends two months recording the album, and then partying all night in strip clubs and just Bon Jovi even said that this was the most debaucherous that they were in their entire 40 year career was the two months recording the third album. And he somehow had money problems, huh? Destroying I, condos <laughs> and spending all night in strip clubs. Yeah, right, 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 somehow right. not. Yeah. It's inexplicable. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So despite all of that, the producer said nobody ever showed up drunk or unable to perform during the sessions. Now, I did want to quickly touch on the album cover. So they originally wanted the album to be called Wanted, Dead, or Alive. They wanted that to be the title track. So they were <clears throat> so they were recording in Canada, and they went to an old coal mine. They had all grown out their beards and took <laughs> photos like they were Wild West cowboys <laughs> with Wait, this did, idea of... Again, did Aerosmith album. do this for an album cover around this yeah, time, too? Yeah, yeah. Like, do they have any original ideas? <laughs> <laughs> they take this Wild West photo. They give it to the studio. The studio laughs and says, hell no. The label comes back with a bright pink album cover featuring a chick with a huge rack wearing a tight T-shirt that said slippery when wet. Bon Jovi said, hell no. So they compromised by Bon Jovi taking a black trash, a black plastic trash bag. He sprayed water on it and wrote slippery when wet with his finger in it. And that became the title that we see here. Well, that is a shit. That's, that's, it. That's, it. that's his <laughs> only original idea. Is that. <laughs> oh. wait, wait, hold on. I heard a slightly different tale. Maybe he was, the documentary didn't make it sound like he was against that original album cover. Of... Oh no, he, he wanted the, uh, he wanted the cowboy one. He said the one that came back with was bright pink. And I think the shirt, the girl was wearing was bright yellow and he said it like but, it was the least rock thing ever well it's very hair metal it was uh it's very provocative let's say kind of like that original love. guns and roses appetite for destruction cover <laughs> but i heard that they printed like half a million copies of that and then and then uh stores said they wouldn't stock it and they had to very quickly come up with a new idea and that's where the oh. garbage bag thing came from okay okay <laughs> Because I know that they had originally printed 300,000 copies of the Pink Boob album, and they sent those to Japan with the intent uh. of always sending those to Japan. But like you said, maybe the destruction of the 500,000 copies was because of stores refusing to carry. Yeah, it could be. There was something about some major chain saying, we will not put this on the shelves, and they had to act quickly. Clover, I mean, you know, Eckinger's the... not the double entendre of slippery when wet is already kind of provocative. And then you really put it in somebody's face with that original picture. It's a, I, I, it's yeah, quite didn't any, I know. And also like, you guys know that like blind faith album that 
Sure. They changed the cover to, you know, that's much worse than a woman in a t shirt. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I don't, I actually think the change though, I think if the that album cover had stayed, this Bon Jovi would not have be, have aged as well in people's yeah, minds. Sure. I would agree. agree. He has escaped the, the scumbag moniker of that. I think a lot. I yeah. He sounds like he was. Yeah. Yeah, don't listen to the chicks. lyrics. Yeah. yeah, don't listen to the lyrics of some of these songs. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> We're not great. But that, right, so like this... when you look at the slippery when wet album cover, you can't read the word when. You're it right. is it, the when is kind of all mishmashed in there. So if you didn't already know what the album title was, it's not evident from because the... yeah, because in the documentary they made it sound like he literally took did it in one take. He stretched yeah, out a hefty bag. Tell. <laughs> and just wrote it, and it was like, "That's it. It's done. That's, that's no need one. to try again." Oh. Yeah, it looks like it looks like garbage. I got to get back to the strip club. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So this album was released on August eighteenth of nineteen eighty six. Sold well, but you're not going to be surprised. The critics were not super impressed. Rolling Stone called them a third generation smudgy Xerox of Quiet Riot. But nine <laughs> months later, the band would appear on the cover of Rolling Stone. Within two months, this album had sold one million copies. It hit number one as an album in October and stayed there for 15 weeks. It was selling more than one million copies per month for six months. That's like two months after its release. And they toured relentlessly to support this album. Now, no big surprise, Bon Jovi goes on to write and release 13 more studio albums, including one that was released this year, being 2024, called Forever. I did not get a chance to listen to that one yet. Oh, uh, I'm sure yeah. it's great. I guess we'll never know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Maybe it's his magnum opus. <laughs> I, I think he got like he got like vocal cord surgery or something. Uh, yeah, recently. singing for 40 years. We'll we'll do that to you. Yeah. Yeah, he was also a heavy the smoker one too. The one random tidbit that I do know is that he has a restaurant in New Jersey where it is pay what you can. So there's no set prices on the menu and people go there and apparently it is supported by people who are like big Bon Jovi fans going there and overpaying for their food. But a lot of people that are local to the area will come in and just get free meals. And he legit works there. Like there's just pictures of him oh in a fucking hairnet washing dishes in the back. <laughs> totally I, candid. Not, you know, he's not doing he it for He seems like a cool dude. Yeah. Like, we've, been, yeah. we've been throwing him some shit, but I have to say he seems pretty down to earth. Hey, don't we call that, do we call that virtue signaling? Is that the right, uh, way it would be if he's actually signaling. doing it and somebody yeah. took a picture just because he's famous. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, it would be I'm different just if saying, he set up a photo shoot for it, but it's I'm just, just saying he comes off well. Who knows what he's yeah. like when he's just at home with his dog, but he comes off yeah, well. Yeah, right. Yeah. All right. Jess. I think also, yeah. I I think also he's 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 one of the few like big rock stars that's been like in a real long term uh, monogamous marriage type situation as well. High so, school sweetheart. Him. Yeah. That I'm sure he didn't cheat on during his time up in Canada. <laughs> 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 or, yeah. Literally yeah. legions of groupies underneath the stage, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> you were but, saying. But he is not, he's one of the few guys from that era that there's not just stuff coming out of being like he had a 14 year old that he brought right. on tour or something <laughs> right. like that. Right. You know, he seems relatively clean and that relatively might be doing a lot of work because a lot of those guys in the era were pretty fucking dirty. So the level of women that would throw themselves at him again, the Hulu thing mentions it, the book mentions it, but I read some other articles where just women would sneak backstage and basically get naked and try to like attack him as he's walking down the call, like down the aisle, the, the hallways back to the dressing room. I mean, women were literally, uh, it was just crazy. So anyway. Right. That's like the, uh, that's, that's like the, the Bob Dylan story where if he goes and eats at a restaurant, he, they have to buy the plates and silverware and stuff uh, from the restaurant because people will just steal, try to steal it and sell it. <laughs> this is fucking weird. <laughs> All right, homies, what do you say we jump into some of these fantastic tracks on our focus list? 